Hello, fellow Mega Tennis. Today we're gonna do something very crazy. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna rewatch an old video, the logo video. I made this video like five years ago or so. So let's so let's see how it is. I don't know. Maybe it's better. And without further ado, it's Mega Ten Minute time. So. The first thing you guys need to understand is that this logo is derivative from the hexagram of Solomon, which is found in the lesser key of Solomon that exists or that was translated by. <laughs> okay, I mean it's a little bad, but let's let's see. Let's let's go a little deeper. Famous, actually. Now the text says quad s superius. Macro prosopis, quad est inferius, macro prosopis. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, okay. So that video was awful. Let's see if Kid Capes can save this. Well, that was weird. Anyway, let me ask you this: What does the name Shin Megami Tensei make you think of? For me, it's the atmosphere which was forged out of its specific use of religious imagery for political themes in a sort of urban fantasy punk setting. As I'm sure you can guess from this channel, my favorite aspect of this series is the religious junk, and this series absolutely oozes mythology and mysticism out of every pore. Part of what sets this tone is the series logo. Right front and center, we have explicit and intricate references to demonology. So today, we're going to be talking about the religious basis behind the original logo for the Shin Megami Tensei series. The most apparent aspect about the logo is its similarity to the hexagram of Solomon, here shown from the Lemmageddon, which is also known as the Lesser Key of Solomon. For context, the purpose of this hexagram was to force demons to take human shape upon being summoned and compel them to listen to your commands. And I should note that, as we move forward, you may notice that the symbols inside the hexagram explicitly affirm an Abrahamic worldview. While today, magic is generally seen as something definitively unchristian, just understand that wasn't always the case. The SMT logo adapts the hexagram by taking the stylized tau shaped cross and replacing it with a reference to the demon Loki, the antagonist of the original Megami Tensei novels. The tau cross, as the name implies, is an alternate form of cross which takes the shape of the Greek letter tau, or more simply, in uppercase T. It represents salvation in part through its relation to Jesus' sacrifice, but also in a reference to the book of Ezekiel. It's sometimes believed to be the shape of the mark from Ezekiel chapter 9, which would save those who mourn the sins being committed in the city of Jerusalem. The SMT logo retains most of the other elements of the hexagram, so let's go over those. Inside of the upper five triangles, in the actual shape of the hexagram, we find the letters T-E, T-R-A, G-R-A-M, M-A, T-O-N. These are all actually syllables that form the Greek word tetragrammaton, meaning four letters, which references the letters that make up the name of the Abrahamic god, yad heh wah -Hey, or Y-H-V-H. If you're wondering why there's no vowels, it's because ancient Hebrew didn't have them. Alphabets like this are called abjads. You were meant to infer how to say it just from the consonants. After the fall of the second temple in 70 CE, the name would fall out of uses due to the priestly class, who viewed it as too holy to be spoken aloud. This, in turn, led it to be lost to history. That said, there is a lot of academia surrounding biblical study, so scholars have come to the consensus that it would be pronounced. Scientifically speaking, of course. Looking at the bottom triangle, we find some really weird symbols. At first glance, they look like an anchor and another Tau cross. But if only it could be that easy. The answer to this can be found by going further back in time and examining its use in other grimoires. For this section, I would advise you to look at the screen if you're not already, because what I'm going to say won't really make sense without visuals. So the hexagram of Solomon I've been showing you so far is based on the one from Mathers and Crowley's Lemmageddon, which was published in 1904. However, if we look at a similar one from the Sloan Manuscripts, MS 3825, also known as the Treatise on Magic, from the 17th century, we find that those symbols were actually mirrored. Then, from MS 3824, also known as the Book of Treasure Spirits, which was written around the same time, we find those same symbols in the same order, but now on the outside of the hexagram. Next, let's switch to the Folger Digital Image Collection and take a look at Folger VB26, also known as the Book of Oberon. This book was written sometime around 1577 and 1583. Here we find the symbols in the same arrangement, now pictured with similarly stylized characters over the top half of the hexagram. 
and earlier in the same book, these symbols are seen together, all lined up nice and pretty in another page as seen here. It's not enough to say what they are definitively, but at least it's starting to look a little familiar. So let's jump to another 16th century book, this time from Chetham's library, Mun A498, also known as the Treatise on Necromancy. It features these symbols in the same arrangement multiple times across the book, used very prominently. And hey look, it even has the exact same sigil that we saw in the last book. Now the pages of the book that I found are from the original copy, and I cannot, for the life of me, read ye old English handwriting. Luckily, this book is partially based on another necromancy grimoire that was attributed to Roger Bacon, and that version of the book has been reprinted legibly. Here we finally find a clear explanation behind the logic of the uses of these symbols found in these magical formulas. It reads, Consider well, the principal characters are these, which should be placed in all circles and in all such laments, because without them, all conjurations of the spirits will fail, and no spirit will answer truth but falsehood. All these characters are letters of Hebrew, and are of the name Tetragrammaton, which were placed in the phylacteries of the forehead of the high priest in gold leaf, as in the old law, and were also placed in Jerusalem. And there we go. It turns out that these symbols were just part of a highly stylized tetragram. What we thought was an anchor was a yod, what we thought was a tau cross is a hay, and that wonky looking L-shaped one was actually a wa. So when we go back to the SMT logo, we have a hay and a yod, which I think is kind of funny, because Hebrew is read from right to left, meaning it's kind of gibberish now. It's like a bastardization of a bastardization of a bastardization. What a rabbit hole. Now that we've talked about the most complicated part of the design, let's talk about the simplest. These being the Greek letters Alpha and Omega, found in the left and rightmost portions of the symbol between the circle and the hexagram. These are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, and in mystic circles, together they represent eternity. We can see this in the first chapter of the Book of Revelation, when John of Patmos is said to have received a vision from Jesus Christ. He greets John by saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. This actually also ties into the meaning of the tetragram, as seen in Exodus 3.14, I am, which has long been interpreted as referring to not only God himself being everlasting, but to the relationship between God and his chosen people. Back to the logo, in the other four quadrants found inside the circle, around the hexagram we find the letters A, G, L, and A. This is a reference to an anagram from Jewish mysticism, or Kabbalah, Ata, Gabor, La Alam, Adonai, which translates to you are mighty forever, Lord. When inscribed on objects, it was believed to give them supernatural protection. In Megaten, this word can also be found in the intro to Shin Megami Tensei 1, in an excerpt from the Grimoire of Armadale. The last symbol found in the SMT logo from the Hexagram of Solomon are the six little spikes around its outer circle. These appear to be stylized crosses, and we can see this more clearly when we go back to the previous hexagrams of Solomon we discussed earlier. The SMT logo turns it into a specific form of stylized cross, called the cross pate. This cross doesn't have much specifically religious meaning, but has found historic use among a series of political organizations. Finally, we get to the last thing in the SMT logo, the text circling the hexagram. It reads, Quad superius, macroposipus, quad inferius, microposipus. Quad superius, quad inferius is actually a shortening of a much longer passage derived from the Emerald Tablet a hermetic religious text. Simply put, it translates from Latin as, as above, so below. This refers to an aspect of mystic philosophy that maintains that if something happens in the spiritual world, it will be reflected in the material world, and even further than that, that the human body reflects the broader universe. As for macroposipus and microposipus, these are more terms from Kabbalah, which refer to certain aspects of God. This will demand a bit of explanation, so just follow along for a while. So in Kabbalah, the true essence of God is infinite and indescribable. At the beginning of time, the fullness of God overflowed. This led to the creation of what we call the Sephirot, which is a chain of God's emanations. These are like lesser versions of God. To give an analogy, this is similar to how if you took a paper and used a copy machine to create a copy, then continued to make copies of copies repeatedly, that over time, the quality of the copy would lessen. The Macroposipus is identified with the first Sephira, Keter, as the hidden aspect of God partially revealed, while the Microposipus is identified with the 4th through 9th Sephira, Chesed, Gebera, Tiferoth, Netzach, Had, and Yazad. Together, these are God fully revealed. This ties back into as above, so below, because the significance of the Microposipus is only realized through the Macroposipus. Again, the Microposipus is a reflection of the Macroposipus, 
and Atlas wasn't the first to make this connection. As it can be seen in artwork, such as the sign of the macrocosm from McGregor Mather's Kabbalah Unveiled. So that's everything in the logo. Personally, I think it's really cool how much thought was put into creating it, especially since this is from like 1992, way before people tend to give Atlas credit for their writing and research. I think it's worth mentioning here that there is another similar logo for the series, designed by Atlas West for the PS2 era. I find this one to be kind of underwhelming. It feels like they just picked a vaguely mystic-y feeling shape, then just put whatever symbols inside of it. To be fair, it's possible that this is a sort of self-censorship for localization purposes, so I can cut them some slack. I think a really interesting thing about learning about these symbols is that, while today they're largely seen as intrinsically mnemonic, these practices were established by actual followers of Abrahamic religion, and because of this, these symbols implicitly affirm that worldview, with God at its head, controlling all spiritual powers. In a way, this juxtaposition kind of plays back into SMT's broader themes, and how symbols are used, and how they can be twisted. An easy example of this is how the figure of Satan and the Mark of the Beast 666 are portrayed as being light law, alongside conventional positive Abrahamic figures. That isn't to say that that was the intent with the logo, but I think it fits well within the series' ethos. Now, here's a bonus for everyone who stuck around to the end. So I wrote this script maybe one or two months ago, and since then, I've been looking into Mega Ten books, right? One of those books was the Shin Megami Tensei Super Famicom Strategy Guide, which, as the name implies, was a guide for SMT1, and in the back of the book, it has a glossary that explains the logo. Now you may be wondering, why isn't this in the meat of the video? That's because the description sucks! And this is very funny to me, so I wanted to talk about it, because it's very wrong in odd ways. It says, Quad Inferius is Latin for the Supreme Being. Now if you remember what I said earlier during that section, you might have guessed that Inferius in Latin actually translates to below, literally the exact opposite of the word supreme. How do you mess this up? It is actually just Latin. <laughs> this is your daily reminder to always fact check Atlas.